Okay, hey everybody, uh, thanks for joining. My name is Eddie Schleiner, and I'm a copywriter and content marketer and the founder of VeryGoodCopy.com, which is where I publish content about copywriting and storytelling and creativity. And to date, I've created over 400 articles and interviews as well as courses and series uh, and presentations like this one, uh, which all live on or inside Very Good Copy. Uh, I was also the lead copywriter at G2.com for a few years, and before that, I was in-house at another tech company, uh, and before that, I was writing copy at an agency. So uh, throughout my career, uh, my work has always demanded ideation and uh, creative thinking, uh, and frankly, for a long time, uh, that was really terrifying to me. Uh, like uh, In the beginning of my career, um, I think I really romanticized the idea of being a copywriter and working in a creative capacity every day. Um, but I was working scared uh, and kind of white knuckling it, um, just in a, uh, I guess, like a constant state of adrenaline, uh, because I didn't know how creativity worked. Um, looking back, I don't think my lifestyle, my habits, my mindset in general was uh, making it easy for me to think creatively. Um, and that made the work really difficult for a while. Uh, it made me question my abilities and it made me question myself um, and ultimately created a lot of anxiety. So uh, when you know we decided creativity and ideation was going to be the topic today, uh, I went ahead and collated nine pieces of wisdom. So these are uh, quotes or sayings or lessons I've come into that have over the years either uh, changed my perspective or ethos uh, or given me confidence or in some other way helped me uh, do better creative work in a healthier way uh, and ultimately a more enjoyable way. Um, and that's important because creativity should be fun uh, and it should be rewarding and it should bring you joy. Um, and that's my hope is that uh, something you learn here today uh, will bring you joy by way of uh, creative clarity or confidence. Uh, because if you can be clear in your thinking uh, and confident in your decision making, you will find yourself having more consistently good, or I guess I should say, you know, viable ideas. Um, and before we jump in, I want to note that most of what I'm about to share is based on broader uh, creative principles. So I will be sharing a few techniques that will help you do creative work. Uh, and then there will be uh, principles designed to help you think creatively. Uh, in all aspects of your work uh, and life. Okay, let's jump in. Uh, and I wanted to start with a concept that when I heard it, not only did it change uh, the way I worked, but it changed the way I saw everything. It was, it was actually uh, a transformational piece of wisdom that uh, I've carried with me you know, through just about every job, every project, uh, every article I've ever written. Um, so it really did change my life. And like most profound things, it's very simple. Uh, it's a quote from an old school direct response copywriter named Eugene Schwartz, uh, who is uh, actually thought to be one of the best copywriters of the 20th century, just based on the sales his promotions brought in. Um, and he was giving a seminar once uh, explaining his methodology and his thought process uh, when being creative. Uh, and that's when he said this. He said, uh, a better word for creativity is connectivity. Um, and it was such a light bulb moment for me because up until that point, creativity was such an abstract uh, concept for me. Like I understood fundamentally that creativity was the act of making something, but how, right? Like uh, where do I start um, and what are the steps and, and how do you go from nothing to something? Um, and it turns out you don't need to start from nothing. Um, in fact, it's almost impossible to make uh, something out of nothing. Um, in that same seminar, Schwartz said, uh, you can't take nothing and make anything. You're not God. Instead, what you are doing when you are being creative is trying to connect uh, two separate ideas that logically would not go together up until that moment. So really, creativity is the act of taking old things and putting them together in new ways. Uh, and if you're a copywriter or a creative director or someone responsible for bringing uh, ideas to the table, uh, this is really comforting, uh, at least it was for me. Uh, like I found great solace uh, in knowing that my job is not to make something out of nothing. Uh, my job is to take two things that already exist uh, that may not normally go together uh, and put them together in a way that makes sense, uh, a way that stirs uh, emotion or tells a story, um, and ultimately a way that people will remember. Um, and in the context of marketing, 
Uh, one of the best examples of this connectivity concept um, are Super Bowl commercials. Um, so if you go back through history, you'll see that some of the best, most iconic, uh, most popular Super Bowl spots are really just connecting uh, disparate things. So for example, uh, here's one from last year. Cheetos has popcorn now? Hey, I'm gonna need you to... Never mind. You can't touch this. Help! You can't touch this. You can't touch this. You can't touch this. I trust you. Why? Have a time. I touched it. New Cheetos popcorn. It's a Cheetos okay, thing. Okay, so basically this is the product of a copywriter and an art director making two things that don't normally go together, Cheetos and MC Hammer, come together in uh, an elegant way. Uh, and that's what makes it so creative, the fact that it's combining two very different things um, in a seamless and compelling way. Okay, here is another example from a couple years ago. Uh, so let me play. Come out, come out, wherever you are. <laughs> I've got new Mountain Dew Zero Sugar with the same refreshing taste as the original. But without any of the sugar! <laughs> Here's Mountain Dew Zero! I am thirsty. Zero sugar. Zero sugar. So again, this commercial is the result of combining Mountain Dew with uh, The Shining, which already exists in popular culture. So the creative team behind this spot isn't starting from scratch, and yet the final product, you know, is still fresh and new. And now here's an example from all the way back in 1984. Today we celebrate the first glorious anniversary of the information purification directives. For the first time in all history, a garden of pure ideology, where each worker may bloom, secure from the pests, obeying contradictory thoughts. Our communication as a force is more powerful a weapon than any fleet or army on earth. We are one people, with one will, one resolve, one cause. On January 24th, Apple Computer will introduce Macintosh. And you'll see why 1984 won't be like 1984. Okay, so I'm sure almost everybody has, you know, seen that spot or at least heard of it. It's considered one of the best commercials, not just Super Bowl commercials, uh, but commercials, period, of all time. Um, and it's the product of connection, not invention. You know, it's the product of taking an existing story or concept um, and connecting it to a product or a unique selling proposition. Um, and you can do the same thing in your business. Um, and to help you do that, uh, I want to show you an exercise that has always helped me. Uh, create two columns, column A and column B. Um, in column A, write the name of your company or your product or service um, or your feature, uh, whatever it is you're trying to sell. And in column B, write 50 random things. Um, it could be nouns, uh, it could be people, it could be uh, allegories, fairy tales, uh, it could be shows, movies, anything really. Um, and if you can't think of 50 things, uh, go to randomwordgenerator.com and it will instantly give you 50 things. So. There's no excuse. Um, and then get several people in a room together and go down the list and try to connect these random things to whatever it is you're selling. Um, try to create a story, a narrative where both of these things exist, uh, just like those commercials did. Um, that is a tried and true mechanism you can use to get this process started. Um, it's not going to do the work for you, but it is going to give you a starting point. And um, it's going to get people talking and ideas flowing, um, and that usually is the hardest part. Okay, um, moving on. So a while back, I was watching a great documentary about a band called Sparks. Um, I've actually never heard of them until I watched the movie, but apparently they were an enormous influence on the entire music industry. They broke a lot of new 
ground as far as the techniques they were using, the stories they were telling in their songs, um, and ultimately the type of music they were creating. Um, and the band is two brothers, Ron and Russell, uh, and it's been five decades and they're still making music, they're still relevant. Uh, they just made an album with Franz Ferdinand, I think, so they're doing something right. Uh, but anyway, in the documentary, Russell said something uh, that resonated with me. He said, uh, I think in the beginning I was trying to be as much like Mick Jagger or Roger Daltrey uh, as I could possibly be, and I kind of missed the mark by a few thousand miles, but something else emerged. Uh, and it's just such a perfect way to express one of the key elements of creativity, which is emulation, right? Copying people. Um, basically, we learn by copying, uh, because when it comes to uh, craft, we can't introduce anything new until we've learned the fundamentals. Uh, and that's why all artists spend their formative years producing derivative work. Um, the Beatles started off as a cover band. Uh, Edward Hopper learned to paint by replicating other paintings. Um, Hunter S. Thompson transcribed The Great Gatsby, you know, just to see what it's like to, you know, type out a great novel. Uh, and obviously Sparks, despite how innovative they eventually became, started off emulating the artists they admired. So the takeaway here, I think, is that being creative doesn't necessarily mean you have to be original. You can copy and emulate and imitate your creative heroes, and it's still beneficial to you as an artist because invariably over time, you will start to make adjustments to their work to align with your unique tastes um, and preferences. And the more you do this, the more adjustments and changes you make, uh, the less recognizable those influences will become. Uh, until eventually, you know, the work is your own and people will see it as your own um, and probably start copying you. Okay, uh, so I heard uh, a designer named Mike Montero say something once and it's, it's never left me. Uh, and I think about it with people um, all the time, especially folks who are, you know, stuck in their creative process. Um, you know, specifically people who don't know what to write about next or what to create next because they feel like they don't have anything to offer. Um, and here it is. He said, the secret to being good at anything is to approach it like a curious idiot rather than a know-it-all genius. So in other words, if you look at this quote through a creative lens, the message is don't put so much pressure on yourself, you know, to be an expert. Um, you know, when I started Very Good Copy, I wasn't an expert at anything. I, you know, I didn't know anything about copywriting, about persuasion, about uh, newsletters or social media or growth marketing or anything that I now teach people. In fact, I started Very Good Copy as a way to teach myself these things. You know, VGC was my way of documenting my education. Uh, and through that process, I killed two birds. Um, and I taught myself copywriting and marketing and I built an audience comprised of people who essentially were learning alongside with me, you know, especially in the beginning. Um, so now, you know, had I told myself that, you know, I, I wasn't qualified to teach marketing because I didn't know marketing, uh, I don't know if I would be here right now. I'm, I'm here because I said I'm going to be curious and study and document my education and share it with anybody who's interested. So. I wasn't an expert who had his own ideas. I was just, you know, a curious idiot who, uh, you know, committed himself to packaging and distributing other people's ideas in my own unique way. Um, and really that made all the difference. Okay. Um, so I love John Cleese. I think uh, he's a lot of fun. Uh, he's an actor, but he's also a writer and he authored a book about creativity um, and it's actually called Creativity. Um, and there are a ton of great lessons in that book, but this one uh, specifically has helped me a lot, uh, especially with very good copy. He says, we don't know where we get our ideas from. What we do know is that we do not get them from our laptops. So in other words, having real world physical experiences uh, is excellent father. Um, and having this in the back of my mind has been invaluable to me while writing and, and ideating uh, for VGC articles specifically because so many of them are framed in a personal story. Um, you know, something that happened to me while I was out in the world, um, you know, just living my life. And I take these stories and anecdotes and happenings and I do my best to connect them or weave them into lessons about copywriting or marketing or creativity. Um, and this is something every one of us can do. If you want to deliver a message, one of the best ways to make it stick is to frame it in a personal story, a story that happens uh, out there away from uh, your computer screen. 
Um, and if you do this, what you'll notice is that other people will see their lives in your stories. Um, and that's because by and large, we're all the same. We're all sharing the, the human condition. So even though your experiences are personal to you, um, they may still be universal. And that's an incredibly uh, powerful thing. So when Cleese says, you know, step away from your laptop to get ideas, um, he's really just saying, go feel something in the real world. Go make a connection with someone um, and then bring that feeling back to your work. And chances are uh, people will empathize. Okay. Um, so Charles Bukowski is one of my favorite writers uh, for many reasons, but um, in part because his creative journey is so uh, inspirational. Um, he worked at the post office until he was in his 50s, um, and he worked there all day, and then he would go home and, and write poems at night. Um, and he did this for decades, writing poems and sending them in uh, to publishers year after year. Uh, but he didn't really make any significant progress. He had some sporadic success but he could never break out in a way that allowed him to quit the, the post office and write full-time for a living. Um, and then one day, a publisher named John Martin found his work and uh, became obsessed with it and convinced that Bukowski was the next Whitman. Uh, so he made him a deal. He told Bukowski that if he quit his job at the post office to work full-time as an author, he would, one, uh, publish anything he wrote, and two, pay him $100 for the rest of his life, whether his writing was successful or not. And, uh, you know, apparently back then it was the 70s, $100 was enough for Bukowski, so he agreed. And Bukowski began writing his first book. Uh, and the story goes, he finished it in three weeks because he was so anxious to get something out there and see the response. So he gave himself three weeks to, to finish the book, and he did. Um, and it's a perfect example of... Uh, Parkinson's Law, which states, work expands so as to fill the time available for its completion. So in other words, if you give yourself a year to write a book, um, it will take you a year to write it. Uh, but if you give yourself three weeks to write a book, it will take you three weeks. Um, and the same law applies to smaller scale projects. You know, So if you give yourself you know, eight hours to write an email, it will take you eight hours to write it. Um, but if you give yourself two hours, you'll finish it in two hours. Um, and that's because by putting a hard deadline on creative work, uh, you won't have time to second guess your decisions and doubt your ideas. In other words, you won't have time to complicate things. Uh, and that's the, that's the secret. That's why Parkinson's law is a law. Uh, time is a luxury that gives you permission to complicate things. And when you take that luxury away, uh, suddenly you're forced to start making decisions and committing to ideas. Okay. Uh, another story about Eugene Schwartz, the copywriter, he got hired to create an ad for a product. Uh, I don't know what it is, but it doesn't really matter. The point is he met the client at a bar uh, and they ordered a few drinks and the client loosened up and started talking about his company and his product uh, and his market uh, for hours. And all the while, Schwartz was there with pen and paper taking notes. And when there was a lull in the conversation, he would just ask another question and the client would start up again. And that night after the bar, Schwartz went home and wrote the ad. And according to him, 70% of the ad was in the client's own words. Even the headline was, was something the client said verbatim. Um, and when the ad ran, it was a winner. And the client was happy and Schwartz earned a, a, a great commission check. Um, and the lesson here in Schwartz's own words is you don't need to have great ideas if you can hear great ideas. Um, and this is especially true in copywriting and marketing. Uh, you know, some of your best ideas and even turns of phrase will come from clients and stakeholders and customers. Um, so your job is less about invention and more about recognition and assembly. You have to be able to recognize a good angle when you hear one, and then you have to be able to assemble it into a story using all of the copywriting elements uh, at your disposal. So for example, a headline uh, is an element. Um, subheads, images, uh, image captions, body copy, CTAs, these are all elements you can use to help assemble a narrative based on you know information and ideas somebody else uh, gives you. Okay. Um, this next one is something I picked up independently over time and you know it's been invaluable, uh, at least to me. Um, and it's probably one of the simplest things I do as a writer, but also one of the most important. Um, you must record your ideas 
as they come to you. And again, uh, it seems so simple, you know, that it's almost not advice. It's like common sense or something. You have an idea, you write it down. Uh, you have another idea, you write it down. Uh, but what I've learned, and I think I, I learned this the hard way, is that it's not that easy. Uh, recording your ideas as they come to you is something you have to train yourself to do. Um, it has to be like an automatic response and you have to be draconian about it for it to work. Um, because it's really easy to every now and then just be like, oh, I'll, you know, I'll remember that. Um, but when you do that, you really underestimate the way memory works. You know, we forget our lives uh, almost as quickly as we live them. And that's really dangerous when you live off your ideas uh, because you never really know which idea is going to be a breakthrough. Um, and inevitably, you will forget it. Um, and if you don't completely forget it, it might morph into something else, something not as good. So I've really committed myself to pulling out my phone and, and writing down my ideas the moment they come to me, um, even if it's you know in the middle of a shower or sleep, uh, you know, I've woken myself up to, to write things down. Um, and sometimes it leads to nothing, and sometimes it leads to some of my best work. And another benefit of constantly and immediately writing uh, everything down um, is that you create a well of ideas to pull from. Um, like, I literally have a folder in, in uh, my Google Drive called The Well uh, with hundreds and hundreds of ideas and notes and kernels, you know, I can use to start writing an article. And... If you don't already have something similar, I, I really recommend it. Just create a, a folder in Google Drive and inside that folder only format documents a specific way so that when you see them, you can instantly start writing and you don't need to put the pieces together in your mind again. Um, obviously, you know, the format will be different you know, for everybody, but for example, the way I do it, I write a headline and then I populate three bullets with additional context. So I'll open a new doc, I'll write a headline or basically the main idea of the article, and then one bullet will be uh, the lesson, um, or I'm sorry, the main idea. Uh, sorry, I'm gonna do this again. Uh, so obviously the format will be different for everybody, but for example, the way I do it, I write a headline and then I populate three bullets with additional context. So I'll open a new doc, I'll write a headline or basically the main idea of the article. And then one bullet will be the lesson I'm trying to teach. Another bullet will be the story or anecdote I'm connecting it to. Uh, and the third bullet might be more context or a link to something similar for inspiration. Um, and this way, even if I come back to this idea months after recording it, I have enough information to, like I said, hit the ground running instead of trying to um, recreate the idea in my head. So yeah, that technique has been invaluable to me, and, and without it, um, I wouldn't be nearly as, as productive as, as I think I have been. Okay, so my favorite show by far is Mad Men, uh, and I love it not only because the main characters are copywriters and it takes place in an ad agency, but um, I love it because at its core, it's a show about the human condition, and, and advertising is really just you know a vessel for a lot of the, the storylines. But anyway, I bring it up because there's an excellent scene uh, early on in the series. Uh, I'm pretty sure it's season one when Don Draper, who's the creative director at the agency, is helping one of the junior copywriters uh, named Peggy brainstorm a campaign. Um, and his advice to her is, Peggy, just think about it deeply, uh, then forget it, and an idea will jump up in your face. And the first time I heard this, I didn't really get it. I didn't understand the mechanism. Um, it was very confusing to me why this would work. Uh, but when I became a student of copywriting, I realized Don Draper was explaining the concept of incubation, which is you know, absolutely real and absolutely works. Uh, incubation is when your brain subconsciously makes new connections, uh, and then these connections randomly bubble up to your conscious mind. So some people call their best connections light bulb moments, you know, when you just have a fantastic idea out of nowhere, like an epiphany. Um, and usually this happens after you take in a lot of information, after you do a lot of research, reading, learning about a specific topic or market or product. Uh, and then you allow yourself the space to not actively think about all of the knowledge you just acquired. Um, and the operative word there is actively, because even if you're not consciously thinking about it all, um, you know, all of that information, uh, your brain is still processing it in the background, you know, making sense of everything you just learned uh, and making connections at the same time. 
And that's why people say their best ideas come to them in the shower, you know, when their mind is, is somewhere else or on a walk or, or during a movie or in the morning when you wake up and you're feeling refreshed and creative. That's the miracle of incubation, uh, of your mind processing and making connections in the background. Um, the only problem is it can be hard to find time to incubate when, you know, for example, you're under a deadline, um, you know, like you don't always have the luxury of stepping away from your work to do nothing. Um, the way I've dealt with this problem is in the past by working on several things at once. So for example, instead of working on one article all day, I'll bounce between three articles. So I'll spend an hour working on each and just alternate my attention. And by doing so, I'm actually still working on all three articles. I'm working on one consciously and I'm working on another, the other two subconsciously. Um, and this way, when I come back to an article, I feel like I have a new lease on it, like I'm looking at it with fresh eyes. So it doesn't always make sense to jump around. Uh, sometimes it's good to be as focused as possible and achieve a, you know, a sort of deep work or flow state. But other times, if you're getting stuck a lot or if you're hitting a wall or if you're feeling like you can't really make decisions, try bouncing between projects and give yourself an opportunity to uh, incubate while you work. Okay, um, so in Chicago, there's a famous comedy troupe called Second City, and it's produced hundreds of uh, household names. Uh, Chris Farley, Steve Carell, Bob Odenkirk, um, Amy Sedaris, Bill Murray, Tina Fey. That's just a handful of the folks who were trained and performed at Second City. Uh, and I used to live right up the street. So, you know, I started going and, and I was taking a lot of writing classes, but I was also taking improv classes. And one of the things I learned, one of the core tenets of improv is yes and. And, uh, you know, what does that mean? It means if your improv partner says something to you, don't just shut her down. You know, don't say no but and, and then go in a different direction. You have to embrace whatever your partner sends your way and then add to it. Uh, because you should be fostering a sense of cooperation and unity, I think, rather than, you know, shutting down suggestions. Uh, because as soon as you shut someone down, you've lost the momentum, you've lost the moment. Um, and if you don't have the moment, the scenario, the story in an improv show, you, you have nothing. You're just kind of up there. Um, so in other words, yes and is uh, the protocol that allows for anything to happen. Um, and that's true for improv performers, but it's also true for anybody doing any form of creative expression, whether you're on stage or you're doodling. Uh, you know, or you're writing a story, the more receptive you are to bouncing around, to trying different things, to rolling with the punches, uh, to embracing uh, uncertainty, the more likely it is you'll come up with fresh, unique, compelling ideas. Um, and that's counterintuitive to most people. Most people naturally want to be selective and maintain control because it feels safer uh, and more predictable. Um, like, not knowing what's coming next in almost any circumstance, but especially, you know, when you have to produce ideas is scary. Uh, but it turns out not knowing is a great way uh, and a great foundation for creativity, you know, which is why you should say uh, yes and on stage as an improv performer. Um, and it's why you should say yes and uh, in life as a creative person as well. Okay, that's all I got. Uh, I hope this was helpful. Uh, and I just want to say uh, thank you very much for uh, spending your time with me.